second verse lift your voices I heard about his healing of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and he caused the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Lift your voices now, oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeemed. verse. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Sing it out, oh victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his seated. Good seeing brother Sam back tonight. Looking Amen. pretty good for just having a baby yesterday. Amen. So I think he said it slept last night. That's why I think he looked so refreshed. He said it was quiet or something. The baby's quiet. So that's a change for his house. Amen. So but a few quick announcements. I'm glad you're back tonight. It's a blessing. I know it's going to be a blessing when, when the preacher gets up here as well. But remember this Saturday, 10 o'clock church, we're going to be going out on soul winning. I hope the Lord's done something in your heart and you want to go tell someone about it now. That's going to be this Saturday, 10 o'clock, teen time, teenagers this Sunday. Make sure you're here. Peanut butter and banana sandwiches. Amen. Yeah. We're going to be doing that, playing some games downstairs. The men and boys camp out. If you haven't signed up yet, that is next weekend, by the way, just so you know. That is next weekend. Not this Friday, but next weekend. So please get signed up. If you have any questions, please come see us. Mother's Day is going to be here before you know it. Hope you, If your moms are still here, try and get her to come to church with you if she doesn't already. See so if you can get her to come to church church on Mother's Day, the mother-daughter activity, ladies, that is the registration is now open on our church app. If you want to go on and register for that, I believe the details are on there of what we're doing. Again, if you have questions, see Miss Andrea 
care, see me, see the pastor, we can answer those for you. And then baby dedication is going to be here very soon. And you can see at the end of May, we have a tour group that's going to be with us as well. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Come on, guys. Look at me over here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Th hey, there we go. And uh, they had to stop playing Minecraft for just a moment, and then they were able to get that, mm, that mic going. Everybody was looking down. I get nervous when you look back there, and you don't see any eyes, any eyes whatsoever. Uh, thank you, guys. I, I'm so, gl so glad that you're here tonight, and that you've made it all the way through. And we've got some gold stars to hand out in the back on the way out for perfect attendance. And thank you for being here on this Wednesday night and looking forward to what's going to happen in this service. And uh, just quickly, I want you to get your songbook one more time with me. And uh, I know we've heard a lot about... Uh, the Holy Spirit in the last few days here in our church, and I'd like to sing with you just a couple of songs about the Holy Spirit and yeah. songs that I really enjoy, and I feel we need more songs about the Holy Spirit. We really don't have many. Uh, there are there are more uh, than we're just in our hymnal, uh, but it's definitely an area that is probably lacking uh, in that way. Uh, but let's turn to number 69, if you would, number 69, and the great song talks about really our role with God, channels only. Uh, I I want to be a channel, a conduit for God's power, and uh, this song talks about that. It has some very nice harmonies in there, so if you can sing those, let's sing them together. Here we go on that first verse. How I praise thee, precious Savior, that thy love laid hold of me. Thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might thy channel be. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power. Flowing through us, thou canst choose us every day and every hour. I like that second verse. Empty that thou shouldest fill me. What is blocking God's power in your life? Uh, not leaving a lot of room for God to be in there. And so this verse talks about it. Let's sing it. Empty that thou shouldest fill me A clean vessel in thy hand With no power but as thou givest Graciously with each command Channels only Master, but with all thy wondrous power flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. Let's try that last verse together now. Jesus, fill now with thy spirit, hearts that full surrender know that the streams of living water from our inner man may flow channels only blessed master but with all thy wondrous power flowing through us thou canst choose us every day and every What a great song there. Let's go back just a few pages. Number 64, and this is probably one of my favorites, the song, Fill Me Now, and Hover Over Me, Holy Spirit. And I like this song, and uh, it mentions that phrase over and over again. It's almost like it's written as a plea, as a cry into the Lord, where just asking Him once is not enough. Fill me now, fill me now, Jesus come and fill me now. So hopefully that's our heart's desire tonight. Let's try this song together. Ready? Hover o'er me, Holy Spirit, bathe my trembling heart and brow. Fill me with thy hallowed presence. Come, oh, come. 
me now, fill me now, fill me now, Jesus come and fill me now, fill me with thy hallowed presence. Come, oh, come and fill me now. Let's try that second verse now. Thou canst fill me, gracious spirit, though I cannot tell thee how, but I need greatly need thee come oh come and fill let's try that third verse now I am weakness here we go I am weakness full of weakness at thy sacred feet I bow divine eternal spirit fill with power and fill me now fill me now fill me now Jesus come and fill Fill me with thy hallowed presence. Come, oh, come and fill me now. Amen. I hope that's been our desire today as we've, uh, I think, grown to have a greater appreciation for the Holy Spirit in our life in the last few days. And hopefully that song will uh, make its way in devotional time and into our prayers uh, that God would have all of us and uh, as we have all of Him. So thanks so much for singing those. Let's uh, uh, get prepared for our offering, please, if we could. Uh, Brother Tin's going to come and lead us in that. But ushers, you get ready as you're prepared, please. Forward. I hope that has been a blessing to you this week. I, it has, I know on the staff part anyway, it's been a blessing to us. But remember, with the blessing, with this also comes a, a price that has to be paid too financially to put on one of these. And as the Lord has blessed you and as He continues to bless the church, let's just give back to the Lord what He has given us tonight and just use it for His honor and glory. Brother Rick, would you ask the Lord to please bless the offering? Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this place. Thank you for blessings of life. Thank you for being faithful. We'll keep you for the Lord these
I hope that you've enjoyed the last uh, four days, really, now, uh, being with the Garraway family. We are so grateful to have them with us and uh, all that they've done. They've, uh, I'm sure, prayed um, in a great way for this meeting as well and uh, driven distance and brought their whole family and sung for us and preached for us and fellowshiped and uh, brought good materials to help our homes. And so I hope that you appreciate uh, what they've done for us. And now, as you do that, though, you need to open your ears and open your heart to what's about to come next. And so they're going to sing a song or two songs, whatever you guys desire to do there, and they'll get prepared for that in just a moment. But uh, we've appreciated uh, their spirit, their joy of the Lord. And it is, I, if we can be human for just a moment, 14 years in evangelism, 14 years of different people, different churches, different hotels, different beds, different meals. It would be very easy to just kind of uh, get weary of it and to have folks who are just still excited about the Lord, and excited about serving God and uh, and uh, to also having to raise children during that time as well. And so let's continue, as he's mentioned, to be in prayer for their family as they head out even past us, that God would use him and his family in a great way to help our country. But uh, thank you so much for being here with us. Sing us some songs and then come and preach if you would. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go unto the house of the Lord. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Oh! 
Good job. Good job. That was a song my wife wrote, uh, let's say maybe a year and a half ago now. And uh, just based there out of that text we find in the book of Hebrews, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but rather let us band together as brethren. Why? There's a spiritual warfare that's raging. Um, what a tremendous privilege it is to be able to be a part of reaching lost souls with the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4 talks about that, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, where the Bible teaches us very clearly uh, that the devil hath blinded, has blinded, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of God should shine unto them. And God has commanded this light to shine out of darkness, and this wonderful joy that we have in knowing our sins are forgiven, our name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. Johnny, do you know that you're saved? Yes. Sir. Alyssa, what about you, baby? Yes, sir. David? Yes. Yes. They remember the time they prayed and trusted in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And this is not something that we should sit on, but it's something that we should share with those in need. Amen. What America needs is this. Amen. Who America needs is Him. And we are simply channels only. Thank you for that hymn. Praise God. One of my favorite hymns. And you didn't even know that. I love that song. And just to be channel. Oh God, just use me. I, I don't deserve to be used. But Lord, uh, you're the one who wants to use me. And so I'm willing. Here, here I am. Here I am. Send me. And this next song we're going to sing is about that. It's entitled, Here Am I, Lord. Send me. David, our 10-year-old, is going to sing um, a song entitled Don't Pass Them By, a song that he wrote with his mother. What was the date on that, sweetheart? 23rd, 2021. September 23rd, uh, back a couple of years ago, 2021. And this chorus came to my son, the, most of the lyrics and uh, the melody that you'll hear in the chorus and worked with his mother, uh, just as Jonathan worked with his mother on that song, He's Always There, that he sang on Sunday night. Uh, David wrote this song with his mother here back a couple years ago. I pray this will... Stir your heart, encourage us to be the witnesses and the testimonies that God would have us to be in the midst of a dark and a perverse world. We're going to be getting to the Word of God after this special. Mighty power. 
could make if you'd let him shine through. See the world through Jesus' eyes when he shed his precious blood. Then go to the fields, they're ready to know of God's great love. Don't just pass them by, they all need the truth. Jesus died for everyone, not just for you, while we sit idly by. Would you join with me in your Bibles to our theme for this year, 2 Timothy chapter number 3, and we were there on Sunday night emphasizing a question that needed to be asked. There's several in this text, and the Lord would have us to focus specifically on just a couple more. And of course, I understand there's no obligation to finish a message, and in all reality, we're not finishing the message, but rather we're... uh, referencing the message and referencing this text, and specifically we'll be getting into 2 Timothy chapter number 4. God gave me something this afternoon. I said, Lord, there's got to be something more. I know you want us in this text, but what is it that you have? About 345 this afternoon, the Lord said, this is what it is. Just listen and just write. And so here we go. We'll be getting into 2 Timothy chapter number 4 in just a moment. However, let's go ahead and begin in chapter number 3. 2 Timothy 3, of course, we launched there on Sunday night asking the question, am I contributing to the chaos? We know that the wickedness in this world will bring damnation and judgment. God is a just and a holy God. He's merciful and he's long-suffering. And by the way, when he gives a message of judgment, it's because of love and it's because of mercy. He's trying to warn people before it's too late. If God didn't care, he would never pronounce judgment. He would never send men, individuals, to herald forth the truth. That the heavens will be opened and the hammer will fall. But rather, because God loves, that's why he gives that message. If God didn't care, he would just let the hammer fall out of nowhere. But it's wonderful to realize that on the flip side of judgment is the message of mercy. Because the message of judgment is pronounced, well, there's still time to get it right before it's too late. However, however, we know that the Bible teaches us in the book of Psalm, uh, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. I'm concerned that's where we've grown as a nation. Uh, We've forsaken the Lord. 1954 was the words under God added to the Pledge of Allegiance. Then less than 10 years later, 1962, 1963, removing God from the public square in education, removing prayer unto him publicly and the Bible from the school system and how that, that was then the beginning of a downward spiral. 1966, the sexual revolution commencing. In 1970, the homosexual movements. And 1973, Roe v. Wade. How that we've slaughtered enough citizens in this country to fill over 15 states. And I'm thankful for the spiritual victory of what happened this past year with the Supreme Court. Thank God for that. Let's rejoice. 
But though we rejoice, let's not lose our resolve to keep on fighting, to keep on going. You see, everything that we're facing as a culture is a byproduct of the spiritual warfare that rages. The political problems, the economical problems, the moral problems, the emotional problems, all the stuff, educational problems, all these things are all fruit, a byproduct of that war that is raging between heaven and hell, between Christ and the spirit of Antichrist, between truth and heresy. May God help us to realize that we are the ones that are standing in between it all. And God is looking down from heaven. And no, it's not nature that is supposed to testify. That's supposed to teach. Now the heavens declare the glory of God. Amen. And if the mouths of the rocks could open and proclaim truth, they would. But they have been sealed. The angels attentively look into this business of soul seeking and soul saving. uh, Soul searching man. Reaching a world with the gospel because Jesus Christ is the answer. Amen. Amen. If we lift him up and as he is magnified, crystal clear, he will draw all men unto himself. Just by way of application, that's the answer to racism. Yes. Jesus Christ. Amen. Soul winning. Evangelism is the answer for America's problems. Amen. I give personal testimony. My dad getting saved out of a life of drugs and alcohol at the age of 32. And before he got saved, the only type of people he would vote for were those who would legalize the usage of marijuana. My dad illegally grew weed. That was one of the reasons mom became interested in dad. Dad grew it. Mom smoked it. Dad uh, was very public and he was very bold, brazen about that. Very brash individual and proud and arrogant and alpha male, if you will, in that sense. And he would grow it in things. And that's the only type of political candidate he was even interested in. Otherwise, he could care less what was going on in the political realm. But after he got saved, things, not magically, but miraculously changed. He said the next time, and if you could have heard him tell the story with his thick Brooklyn accent, he would say the next time I was voting just a few months after I got saved, as I got in that little booth, and of course, you know how you pull that little curtain way back in the day, you know, and you're in this thing and you're trying to fill out the little uh, spots and such with the marker. He said, I found myself voting for conservative people. And he said, I put the pen down and I stopped for a moment. I thought, "What? what am I doing? That's how he would talk, you know, scratch the forehead like that, just thinking. And then it dawned on me, it was Jesus. Jesus was changing me. He had a revival right there in that booth. Of course, he was being discipled. He was growing in the Lord by leaps and bounds. Praise God. He wasn't saved and then left out to dry, you know, like a newborn baby left on an operating table. All right, now that you're here, oh, fend for yourself, and that's where the food's stored, and this is the bathroom, and this is where you can find your change of clothes, and go ahead, take care of yourself. Doesn't work that way, does it? How about it, Dad? <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And just like new babes in Christ, just like new babes are dependent upon others to raise them and to rear them and help them grow, so are new babes in Christ. The Great Commission is so essential, and it's full spectrum. Jesus Christ will change the heart. Jesus Christ will change the mind. Jesus Christ will change the attitude and the spirit. Jesus Christ will change uh, the makeup of an individual and uh, uh, the nature of a person. And Jesus Christ is what America needs. The spirit of God within as we preach these past couple of days, as it seeks to guide and convict and draw all these things. That's what America needs. We see this list given in verse number one down to verse number five. And I'm concerned that we find these categories in these groups of people even prevalent within the house of God. I hope not in this church, but in churches all across America. And could it be that as you just uh, glimpse over it tonight, uh, that we find ourselves guilty of something of this nature. And I pray that you were once guilty of it and you're still not guilty of it now. But rather, as the preaching uh, was going forward very radically and in a raw way, God was just exposing and God was helping us, really. God was helping us on, on Sunday night that we said, Lord, I have been guilty of being a lover of my own self more than a lover of God. I have been covetous. I have been this. I have been that proud. All these things, oh God, I'm sorry, convict me and break me. And once God breaks us, then he can remake and reform something beautiful. And he always makes beauty out of the ashes. We're going to skip down now to verse number 13. Real positive preaching here in this verse. The Bible says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, 
deceiving and being deceived. <laughs> well, that's real helpful. <laughs> it's going to get worse. How many, how many want to do a skip in the park with that verse? How many want to do a little uh, a, a clicking of the heels and a little bit of that uh, hopscotch, a little bit of those cartwheels? Hallelujah! It's going to get more wicked. No. But God, very realistically, is just showing unto us and revealing unto us that things are not going to be easy. Things, potentially, will become harder. But in spite of that, verse number 14 then says what? The next three words. But, or you know what? In spite of that, and even though that may be commencing, but, however, continue. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Don't give in. Rather, give it all you've got. Amen. Keep on keeping on. But continue, notice, thou. Now, I know he would speak collectively to the church, but this whole book was not written to a church. It was written to an individual. And right now, God is seeking to speak to the individual. On an individual basis, that each and every one of us would have a heart of commitment, as we'll see here in just a few minutes, that we would have a heart that is not going to quit or take it easy or back off or slow down, but rather we will desire to ever stay in that gap and stay making up the hedge and all the different passages that we can consider, earnestly contending for the faith and quit your like men, First Corinthians 16, 13, and be strong and, and pressing toward the mark and uh, go in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, all these things, uh, to not quit but to continue in spite of the evil in spite of the seducers in spite of all these things waxing and growing greater and worse and more decadent and filthy and deceitful you stay faithful why god always blesses faithfulness by the way romans chapter number five if i'm not mistaken the bible says but where sin abounded Verse number 13 sounds like sin is abounding. But where sin abounded, grace did much more Amen. abound. Amen. And even though wickedness seems to be ever increasing, even exponentially, insurmountable as some sort of tidal wave that's sweeping across our land and all of the agendas and all the sin and all the decadence and filth and abominations that our culture is so flippantly and so carelessly and so blasphemy committing before the very face of God to realize that even though the wrong is off so strong, God's still the king and God's still the ruler and God's still sitting on his throne and God's still in control and God still has all the power and behold Hold the Lord's hand. He is not shortened that it cannot save. He is still able to do a great work in our lifetime and our generation. And he wants to do that work. And he wants to do that work through you and me. Mind-blowing. We can't make a difference, but God can. And God wants to use us to be the tools and the vessels, the instruments in his hand to make that difference and to impact eternity. But continue thou. Question needs to be asked. We're skipping over some others. We'll just give you this one. Am I continuing in spite of the chaos? If we're not easy, we can get discouraged. Disillusion real quick. You turn on the news just for five minutes. Everything is negative. Everything is death. Everything is Debbie Downer. All this, you know, oh. Is not God still God? Amen. Does he not still have all power? Does he not desire to anoint the church with this power that is not of earthly realms but is of a heavenly plane and domain in which supernaturally can be then utilized in reaching an entire planet with hope and with the gospel? Yes. But God can't do that work if we are not willing to stay after it. What's so wonderful is you read through the word of God, you'll find this testimony given. I call it the remnant clause in the Bible. Our hearts are burdened about that thought. Remnant ministries, as you can see, God has never needed a majority to make a difference. Amen. 300, you know, with Gideon. <laughs> 10. 
in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Think about that for a moment. And of course, I understand it's through the intercessory prayer and the fervency uh, of, uh, of Abraham. That's just mind-blowing that he would argue with God. And they would say, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Man, what boldness in prayer. God give us boldness in intercession. And I believe God is looking for an excuse to let mercy prevail. Because God is love. But God is just, and he cannot allow sin to go on unpunished. Generations may pass, but there will come a day as we start out with this message that judgment will fall. And I believe it pains his heart that it must be done. Yet at the same time, it must be, has to be done. But you'll think about Sodom and Gomorrah, two entire civilizations that had given themselves completely over to abomination and filth. Unmentionable things. Unthinkable acts. And God said, yes, if I find just but 10 people, 10 righteous individuals, people that were not Christians, that were pattering themselves after the world, but people who were pattering themselves and living according to what God would have them to do. Not their own form of holiness and godliness, but rather, Lord, how do you want me to live my life? I yield myself unto thee. Righteousness is not our own good deeds. But righteousness, a definition that, uh, I don't know how many, handful of years ago, uh, just kind of put it this way. Righteousness is allowing, yielding, allowing the holiness of God as we see defined in his word and described through his person. Righteousness is allowing the holiness of God to fill us from the tip of our toes to the top of our head and then flow through us and affect our everything. And this kind of piggybacks to the message and comes full circle back to the message on Sunday night where I am not the one setting my standard, but rather God is the one setting the conviction. And the reason we are who we are is not because of a certain list of dogmas or preferences or this, that, or the other, but rather it's rooted and grounded in Scripture. And as a result of a chapter and verse, there is application to the context of the situation. Say, well, show me this or that. And sometimes there's not specifics because God doesn't need to get technical. He just needs to give a general principle that'll take care of the whole gambit. Remember we said that on Sunday night? I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. There's no way you can get around that. So therefore, there's no longer any justification for wicked things coming into the eye gate and any form of medium or media. Period. There are no exceptions. So you can excuse it away. I can try to justify it, but it ain't flying with God. So take it or leave it. No, let's take it. Amen. Say, oh, God, convict me. And and I know you're still working on me. Help me to grow. My flesh is kicking and screaming, going back to the message the other night of the filling of the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's wanting to be in control. It doesn't want to be dominated. It wants to be the dictator. But God, help me to bring this thing down in a subjection and a submission. I want you to rule and reign in my life. Oh, God, this is the principle. That's why I said the other night, I, I... I understand the word standards, and I, I, I use the word, but I'm more now at this point in my life. I don't know why, but this is where the Lord's growing me. I'll word it that way, at least for my own self and my wife and I. Instead of calling it a standard, let's call it a biblical conviction. Amen. That has a whole lot more weight to it. Amen. Well, that's your standard. No, this is my biblical conviction. And I'm not saying that to, you know, knock somebody across the head with, you know, verbally. <laughs> No, but, th- but this is why I am, and this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because God has given me persuasion from his principle. Here's a little gold nugget. All of our preferences, because we're not cookie cutter, right? We're all uniquely, fearfully, and wonderfully made. All of our preferences and all of our positions should always be aligned with biblical principles. Can you as a grown man look at me in the eyes and tell me why you do what you do. Can you talk to my wife, ladies, and tell her, so on and so forth. We should be able to have that free and frank interchange and exchange with each other, that communion with one another. And if you don't know the why behind the what, let's search the scriptures and be built up as the Bible teaches us in the book of Jude, built up upon our most holy faith. Thank God that we've got the Bible. We've got truth. And may we not disregard it, but may we be determined with it, delight in it, devoted unto it, determined with it to go forward and to embrace what it says. You know, the anchor is obedience. It really is. It's obedience. 
I know we don't obey sometimes. I'll be the first to raise my hand. (laughs) But the anchor and the tether is always obedience. It's always submitting myself under the authority of what God says. Whether I like it or not. And if we just yielded in a spirit of obedience, that would take care of a whole lot of struggles that we have in our carnal, natural, fleshly nature. Obedience. Obedience. Am I continuing in spite of the chaos? But continue thou. Continuing forward very quickly. We're we're trying to get somewhere. The Bible says, notice in verse number 14, and the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of. I hope that you thank your pastor for being a man of God that preaches and expounds what the Bible teaches. He's not a man that gives you what he thinks, but he's giving you what God says. And as an under-shepherd of this, and as a guardian of the flock, and given this opportunity to expound truth, application will be given. The excuse me, nuts and bolts of the Christian life And some of the practical how-tos, which are essential, can be given to give us guidance to, if anything, get our minds in gear so we can think with the head that God gave us and screwed on our shoulders to think with, ultimately with that mind of Christ. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of. Don't compromise. Continue. You know what compromise is? Compromise is when I change my mind about something God has not changed his mind about. Well, I used to be this way, but you know, grace and just all this stuff. No, no, no. As we said the other night, we say this again in love, God's grace will never condone. God doesn't wink at sin. He will never, oh, it's okay. God's grace will never condone what his holiness condemns. Because Titus 2 says, the grace of God that brings salvation teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And grace is not liberty to live like a sinner now that I'm saved. But grace is liberty to live like my precious Savior now that I'm saved. It's not freedom to sin It's freedom from sin. Praise God for grace. An underpreached doctrine of the Bible, I believe. We need grace. But continue thou in these things. Don't compromise. Don't quit. Don't be careless with it. Uh, Please, God is saying, I'm begging of you. Continue. Keep on going. I only need a ten righteous people. In the midst of Sodom and Gomorrah, And I would have literally spared those two heathen civilizations from the outpouring of judgment that they rightfully deserved. The clouds of hellfire and brimstone would have been rolled away and they would have woken up and lived another day to even continue to engage in their own idolatry and abominations. You know, 10 people, if they were found, were literally going to be used by God to be the prevention of wrath and the preservation of an entire godless civilization for another day for potentially experiencing mercy and grace and salvation and hope. Those 10, if they were found, from a human perspective, let's just put ourselves in that place. If we were, if there was 10 of us that could be found there in Sodom and more, man, man, I, I don't know, brother. It's like we're trying to make a difference for Christ, but nobody's wanting to listen. Everybody could give a rip. They blaspheme in the name of God. They laugh in our faces. But we're just going to stay faithful. Man, I feel like we're not scratching the surface. We ain't making a difference. But you know what? Let's just keep on going. Let's just keep on doing what we're supposed to be doing. Keep on standing and keep on speaking and keep on singing and keep on showing. Keep on shining. Let's just keep on keeping on. And they had no clue if they had been found. They were literally the ones that God said, yes, 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 yes. Ten, they're found. Hallelujah. Judgment is not going to come. Mercy, sweet mercy. Praise God. Grace can be administered and given to these civilizations. I don't deserve it, but we'll give it. I want to give it want to give it you know i don't know how many are needed to spare america 
but it can start with you and me. Yes. Wholeheartedly all in, a spirit of reckless abandonment, surrendering her all to the cause of Jesus Christ and the gospel and truth. It may feel sometimes that nobody's listening and everybody wants to blaspheme and the whole nation could give a rip about truth and the word of God and Jesus Christ and the Bible. But we're going to keep on going in spite of the chaos. If God looked tonight for a righteous remnant, would you be in that number? Do you still have sin in your life that you refuse to get rid of and get right about? Do you still have carnal ways? Fleshly means. Weights of sin. Worldly habits that need to be purged. I know we'll never be perfect. We've already said that multiple times. I feel like I'm kind of like a broken record repeating myself tonight in some things. We'll never be perfect. But moment by moment, day by day, sometimes hour by hour, oh God, help me to be a vessel unto honor. Sanctified meat for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. Second Timothy talking about that, if I'm not mistaken. Is that Second Timothy? Second, is that Second Timothy? Two? Yes, it is. So it's in the same book. Amen. For a moment, I thought it was First Timothy, but it's right there in Second Timothy, chapter number two. Just look at it very quickly. The Bible says in verse number 19, um, what a wonderful blessing. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, uh, having this seal. Uh, and there's so much preach here, and I'm, I'm trying to be careful uh, tonight. My heart is just so full. I'm preaching from the overflow. Listen, the foundation we have, it's never going to fade away. Truth is truth. Amen. It will endure and stand the test of time, come what may. Praise God. Stay faithful. We can be faithful because it is faithful and it standeth sure. Having the seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. God knows who you are. Amen. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ do what? Roll around the muck and the mire of this whole world. Enjoy this and feed the flesh and justify temptation and whatever and the lusts and all this kind of junk. No! Depart! Flee! Run! Abstain! Depart from iniquity. Verse number 21, If any man therefore purge himself from these, this sin, this iniquity, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified or set apart for the master's use, and meet, meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. God has a work that he desires to do, and we can enjoy being used of him as a vessel in accomplishing not just some works and a few works, but rather every good work. And I'll speak for myself, and I mean this. This is my heart's desire as I live daily. I want God to use me to accomplish every good work that he has for me, specifically in my life, in his will, the way he has for us as a family. But individually, I want to accomplish Every good work. Amen. Do you have that drive and determination? Am I continuing in spite of the chaos? See, God sees and blesses the faithfulness of even just but a few. That from a temporal, physical perspective, it may not look like they're making a difference, but they are. Because God sees and God will use it. Um, just let me read these if I could be uh, so abrupt tonight uh, and just very curt, just trying to get back into this. Ezekiel twenty two thirty. I sought for a man, singular, just one, an individual among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. God was just looking for one person in that generation. Sadly, that, that hour spoke that there was none to be found, but our chapter in history has not yet been written. Amen. Come on now. Jeremiah 5.1, run ye, Jeremiah 5.1, run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. How about this? Run ye to and fro through the streets of St. Louis, of Imperial. You put your own community there, in there, and, excuse me, see now and know and seek in the broad places thereof. If you can find a man, you can find someone, anyone, just one, a man. If there be any that executed the judgment that seeketh the truth, Passionate about the Bible, Bible believing and Bible living and Bible reading and Bible trusting, Bible exalting, and I will pardon it. 
God has never needed a majority to make a difference. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. <sighs> so discouraging. Becoming disillusioned so quickly. Oh, hold on. But, in spite of all that, we're just going to go ahead and blow past that. Pfft, forget all that. But, that's what that word means and signifies. But, continue thou. It doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. Even within the four walls of this building, what are you doing as an individual? Well, that's just for a few hyperactive people, you know, really just sold out of the things of God and those that are really surrendered, and that's for the staff, and that's for the Sunday school teachers or the deacons or this or that or the other. That's not for me. Yes, it is. Is that not your Bible? God has a message for you. And you can choose to obey it or disobey it. Let's band together and obey it and see what God can do. As this passage of scripture continues, such a wonderful thing that we're continuing in, in the word of God. In the word of God, verse number 15, for the young people tonight, and that from a, from a child. Thou hast known the holy scriptures. Don't turn your back on the word of God. Your parents are investing in you, your pastor, your school teachers. If you're going to a Christian school, investing in you, don't turn your back on that. From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. This book not only will save you eternally, but this book will save you temporally. Here upon this earth, it's going to save you from a lot of heartache, a lot of suffering, a lot of snares, a lot of junk. Amen, folks. Amen. Children, follow the Bible. Amen. Well, but it's not really popular in my school. Who cares? Give it 15 years, you won't even remember the names of your classmates. But, you know, it's like, just live for God. Amen. Children in this room, live for God. Amen. Continue thou. All scripture, verse number 16, all scripture, every word, every part, all scripture is given by inspiration of God as God breathed. And God desires to daily breathe that upon you and within you. This is a present tense verse. It wasn't just once given, excuse me, uh, with inspiration, and now it's just a dormant dead book. But right now, it still liveth, the Bible says. It abideth and endureth through all generations. It's applicable for right now. This book is alive, and God desires to breathe life and spiritual sustenance and nutrients into your life daily. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. The whole Bible is for our benefit. It's all helpful for doctrine. What's doctrine? Oh, for what's right. Don't get your definition of doctrine anywhere else but the Word of God. Amen. For reproof, what's that? Well, the things that aren't right. It's helpful. God's trying to help us. Don't ignore it. Receive it. For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, what's that? Well, how to get things right. For the instruction in righteousness, how to, how to, how to walk right with the Lord and stay right with God. That the man of God, the Christian, may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto what? Some. Most. All. All good works. I charge thee, therefore, of course, back when the Bible was given, given, there were no chapters and verses, but I'm thankful that we have those now because things can be done decently in order. We all don't have massive scrolls that we're walking in with. Ah, you know, just, okay, roll it out a little farther and then look down the, down the column. It, are ours the same? That way you can figure out where I'm at. Chapter and verse, we got it. But what happens is we read the Bible and we just stop at the end of the chapter. No, keep on going. In your devotions every single day, I challenge you, I do this myself, every single day, read past the end of the chapter and go into the next couple of verses in, of the next. Just to make sure you get the full context of what's being discussed through the passage. But let's continue. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That's powerful because long suffering is talking about having the right disposition, have the right spirit. And doctrine, have the right disposition and also the right position. Speak the truth unashamedly, but in love. Have conviction, but also have uh, the character of Christ. Have compassion as you're speaking this truth. For the time will come that, uh, and when uh, they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall heap to themselves, what's the next word? 
teachers. I have nothing wrong with teachers, and I'm not going to be passive aggressive about teaching. Uh, but this is interesting. This is the first time I saw this in my entire life. And again, I'm not trying to manipulate the Bible, but my wife and I, we were talking about this last, well, two weeks ago. We were all the way in, uh, San, where were we? Sacramento, California, finishing up a revival meeting. We were in California since January um, and things, and we we're finishing up a revival out there. And I said, you know what? It's interesting. The Bible says, preach the word. They're not going to do our sound doctrine. And as a result of not enduring this preaching, they're going to heap to themselves, not preachers, but teachers. We need preaching. Amen. Now we need teaching as well, but we need preaching. Amen. What happens is that people, they don't want the preaching sometimes because of how the Lord might use that to the expounding to bring conviction. And rather than what they want to do is they want to surround themselves and saturate their lives with men that are going to stretch them mentally and woo them with words and theology and ideology. But don't bring me any confrontation. Don't bring me any conviction. Just give me content. We need confrontation. Amen. Now, it's not a preacher confronting people. You understand that, right? It's the Lord doing a work. <laughs> and half the time, as preachers, we're just holding on saying, God, are you sure? I don't want to say that. I don't want to preach that. We, we, better, we better preach it. We better obey the Lord. Because we will literally be committing sin in the sanctuary if we do not preach what God would have us to preach. Preaching demand a, demands a verdict, as someone once said. And may God bring us to a place as we hear the preaching that a decision is made or is not made. But there's always a line drawn in the sand. I believe this is a church that steps across that line and obeys the Lord. My wife and I have been refreshed by being with you. We're thankful for the kindred spirit, and I say that. Thankful for your pastor. I really, there's a bond. We're thankful for this church. We love you folks. We really do. It's been so wholesome and wonderful. It's not always that way. And I'm not looking for confrontation, but sometimes God has us preach a hard truth. Okay, we're going to preach it. But in love, soaking it, bathing it in long-suffering. Preaching it because when the day is done, you need to obey, but I need to obey too. You realize that the pastor and the evangelist, we have to put our heads in the pillow at night as well. That we also have to stand and give an account to God because we are not God. <laughs> Contrary to what the Catholic Church would have you to believe concerning priests and things of that nature, we are but mere men who put our britches on the same way as the rest of you. And we will have to stand and give an account for even every word that's spoken in a message. I'm so burdened because I do not want to be guilty of saying the wrong thing. I'm thankful for liberty in the Lord and by the Spirit through the preaching. But to always in the back of the mind being hypersensitive to his leadership and his leading. All of these things because it's so necessary. Needful. God help us to preach the word. We're going to draw some application here in just a moment, but let's continue uh, to go uh, into verse number four. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But, but, uh, you know what? That's going to happen. <laughs> Forget about it. Hey, but, but you, you, but watch, uh, uh, but watch thou. Again, bringing it to the individual, but watch thou in all things. And your afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Final question, and there's some application drawn from this text. We still have a few minutes remaining, but let's jot it down. Let's meditate upon it. The final question that we need to consider tonight, am I committed to stand and work against the chaos? Am I contributing to the chaos? Am I continuing in spite of the chaos? Am I committed? Can't you sense the urgency and intensity with the verses we just read? 
Yeah, the world. Yeah, this. Yeah, sin. But, but, but hold on. You, you continue. Watch now. Preach the word. You, I charge you. I'm challenging you. I'm commanding you. I am telling you. Come on, is what God is saying. Am I committed to stand and work against the chaos? The tragedy today is that too many Christians are saying nice things about Jesus and doing nothing for Jesus. They are complimenting, complimenting him, but not committed to fully live for him, unashamedly professing him before men. Amen. Romans 12, 11 says, as each individual in this room, this should be our character tonight, not slothful in business. We're not sluggish. We're not lazy in doing what God would have us to do in his will and in his work. Rather, we are fervent, the Bible says, in spirit. There is something boiling and burning within us. There is a heat. There is an energy. Fervent in spirit. And by the way, your spirit can be on fire when you have the fire of the spirit. How about that? Amen. Serving the Lord. This word serving means to be a slave unto serving the lord notice in verse number two of second timothy chapter number four very quickly machine gun style mentioning these things and we'll end with a wonderful story how about this you could jot this down preach the word all the here here's the thing we could truth we could jot down uh, how, how can we be committed to work and stand against the chaos number one this is what god gave me this afternoon really this is the crux of the message here uh, this is how we can be committed number one by resolving to proclaim truth at any time, in the right way, whether it's popular or not. Isn't that the context of verse number two down to verse number four that we just took four or five minutes to discuss? By resolving to proclaim truth, God give us men, women, young people, children tonight that will understand God has charged the individual. You're a born again Christian. There is no one exempt from this. There is no one excused from this. But rather, may we grab a hold of this great charge to be resolved in proclaiming truth at any time. Be instant in season and out of season. In the right way. Sometimes it is reprovement or reproving, rebuking, exhorting. In the right way. As it's being done, any of those three, it's always with all long suffering or all of it, the whole gamut, all of the grace, mercy, love, tender looking, all that, all the long suffering and doctrine. It's not built up upon what we think, but it's based on what God says. I love what Charles Spurgeon once wrote. He said this, uh, churches are not made that men of ready speech may stand up on Sundays and talk and so win daily bread from their admirers. These places of worship are not built that you may sit comfortably and hear something that shall make you pass away your Sundays with pleasure. A church which does not exist to do good in the slums and dens and kennels of the city is a church that has no reason to justify its longer existing. A church that does not exist to reclaim heathenism, to fight with evil, to destroy error, to put down falsehood is a church that, does not ex that, that should not exist. We should uphold righteousness, he said. The glory of the church is when she lays aside her respectability and dignity and counts it to be her honor to gather together the outcasts and her highest honor and glory to seek amid the foulest mire the precious jewels for which Jesus shed his blood. To rescue souls from hell and lead them to God, to hope, to heaven. This is her heavenly occupation. Oh, that the church would always feel this. Amen. We're living in a dark day. And what America needs is the truth. The Bible is the message of love, hope. Joy, peace, righteousness, that brings fulfillment to every man's need. I already quoted from Philippians 2 earlier this week, standing over by the piano, that we as a church should, and individually should be in the midst of a crook and a perverse nation. Kind of sounds like America. Among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. Number two, the Bible says, but watch thou in all things. Verse number five, but watch thou in all things. How can we be committed to stand and work against the chaos? Number two, by remaining vigilant, lest the enemy gains advantage over us. By remaining vigilant, lest the enemy gains advantage over us. But watch thou, be careful. You can become a casualty because this is war. 
The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, it's such a warning, verse number 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth. You're preaching the word. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. Keep, keep doing it. Continue. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. This word watch is used but a handful of times in the New Testament. The same word watch that's used here has also been accurately translated to be this word of sober in 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant. Be wary. Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The devil wants to destroy your marriage. The devil wants to destroy your pastor. The devil wants to destroy the pastor's wife, the pastor's family. He wants to destroy your children. He wants to destroy this church. The devil's design for every person or biblical entity is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. John 10.10. 10. He's not a teammate. He's not a buddy. He's not a friend. He has one agenda, and he is a vicious adversary doing anything in his power to take you down and to take you out. And the only way that we'll be able to be committed and staying the course and doing what God would have us to do is by remaining vigilant lest the enemy gains advantage over us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 5, and 6 says, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Amen, church. Therefore, let us not sleep. Spiritual apathy, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. That's a whole message in and of itself. But moving on along, point number three. And yes, we are moving to the third point. And anybody who has their jaw on the ground, yes, go ahead and pick it back up. We are moving along. Wow, it's a miracle. <laughs> Such a heavy emphasis and a heavy thought there. There's so much more substance that we could glean from, but take that, meditate on it, let the Lord help you in that area, as I need help in that area as well. All of us do. And your afflictions, verse number five. How can we be committed to stand and work against the chaos? Number three, by refusing to quit even in the hard times. We've already preached this point tonight. By refusing to quit even in the hard times. There's times that we want to throw in the towel, but I'm thankful we can see the track record um, uh, throughout the Word of God. David himself encouraging himself in the Lord and those that went through seasons of discouragement, even oppression, that God was able to lift them up out of that and God was able to help them through that. And by the way, one of the ways that you can be uplifted and encouraged is through music. That's why it's so important to be careful of the music that you're listening to. Number four, do the work of an evangelist. You need to be doing my job. Number four, how in the world can we be committed? How can we be used of God to work and stand against the chaos? Number four, by reaching the lost. Amen. It's not complicated. You know, if everybody got saved, everybody would have the Holy Spirit convicting. You know, I think if everybody was in church, Bible preaching church, would have a whole lot less crime. Though there'd still be crime, because we got people that are understanding. Man, there are ten commandments. James Madison himself said, "We have built our civilization on a society and a culture that is governing themselves." And I'm quoting: "Governing themselves by the ten commandments of God." Here's an architect of our government speaking, trying to help us. The first half or so is our relationship with God. Second half, our relationship with each other. By refusing to quit even in the hard times, but by reaching the loss, John Wesley declared this, you have one business on, on earth to save souls. God has given us the great commission. It's not the great consideration. It's not a suggestion. It's not good advice or some random opinion. Uh, but rather, Christ's last command must be our first priority. I believe tonight that any Christian or church who is not actively seeking to reach the lost as God gives them opportunity and appointment is backslidden and living in open disobedience before a holy God. I'm concerned that many independent Baptist churches have taken the Great Commission and turned it into the Great Commotion. All this talk and all this busy work, but is business actually being accomplished? 
by reaching the lost. God spoke to Paul in Acts 26, Rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. I want to use you, Paul. What's the purpose? To make thee a minister and a witness. I want you to reach souls with hope. Verse number 18 of Acts 26, Here's the purpose fulfilled, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. The Great Commission is not to be the ministry of choice for a few hyperactive believers in the church. The Great Commission is the purpose of the entire church, and the church is not this building or its properties, it's its people. It is its people. It was given to every believer to reach every person, to save every nation. Not one town, village, or city on the planet is exempt from experiencing the Great Commission being carried out. Not one Christian is exempt from doing and engaging in the Great Commission. Not one church is exempt from God's mandate of reaching souls. May the Lord help us to fulfill the Great Commission. Number five. How can we be committed to stand and work against the chaos? By reserving my life for God's work alone through the end of it all. By reserving my life for God's work alone through the end of it all. The Bible says, notice in verse number five, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. God has called every single one of us to be full-time Christians. Well, he's the pastor and he's an evangelist and -and so-and-so's a missionary or prison event, whatever. I guess, you know, I've never been called into the ministry, preacher. I guess I'm just not as important in God's lineup of things. (laughs) Who have you been listening to? Because it ain't the heart of the Lord. God is no respecter of persons. And God does not view him or esteem him or even me or anyone in this room greater than you. There's no pecking order with God where, you know, we're in the ministry, so we're the first string. We're the starting players. Well, you know, I'm third string. You know, maybe if if it gets so desperate and we're losing by 50 points, they'll let me go in. (laughs) Yeah, I got the ball. Look at me. Woo! You know? No. We are all essential. God has given you life for such a time as this, and it's for a purpose. And you have heavenly potential. Listen carefully. Do you believe in yourself as God believes in you? Do you see yourself as God sees you? By divine design for a reason to reach a world with hope. The Bible says, make full proof of thy ministry. This phrase, word, wording full proof, means, and I quote, to carry through to the end, to finish and fulfill in every aspect and every part. Make full proof. There's not one person left, not one job undone, not one task that is just, well, I kind of just lost track of that. And it is what it is. But we have accomplished it all. Amen. Unto every good work, the Bible said in 2 Timothy chapter number uh, 2, uh, unto all good works, 2 Timothy 3, verse number 17, God wants to use you, and I pray tonight that every single human being in this room, I'm serious about this, that we are all surrendered to God, that there has been a moment in your life in which you've surrendered yourself to Christ, you said, God, I yield, I give myself and my future and my purpose to you, I surrender all. Amen. Amen. Has there been a watershed moment in your life when you surrender your life to Jesus Christ? Amen. If you haven't, tonight's the night. I'm done with this story. Is everybody okay? Is everybody good? Amen. We're almost through. There's a few more moments. During the summer of 1952, in Lansdowne Baptist Church of South London, The Sunday morning service was closing and a visitor stood up in the back raising his hand. He said, excuse me, pastor, can I share a little testimony? The pastor looked at his watch. (laughs) It's a visitor. (laughs) He said, you got three minutes. And the man proceeded. He said, I just moved into this area. I I came from Sydney, Australia. Just a few months ago, before I left for England, I was walking down George Street. George Street is one of the busiest streets in downtown Sydney. 
He said, and a strange little white-haired man stepped out of, the, out of a shop doorway and put a pamphlet in my hand and said, excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? He said, I was astonished by those words. Nobody had ever asked me that. I, I thanked him courteously, and all the way on British Airlines, this puzzled me. I called a friend who lived in this area where I'm living now, and thank God he was a Christian. He led me to Christ. I'm a Christian, and I want to join this church. Everyone applauded and welcomed him into the body of Christ. This Baptist pastor from Lansdowne Baptist Church in South London flew to a conference the, ne conference the next week to speak, and in the middle of the meeting, after the service one night, a woman approached him in the foyer for some counseling, but he wanted to establish first that she, where she stood with Christ, and, and he said, tell me, what is your salvation testimony? She said, I used to live in Sydney. Just a couple of months back, I was visiting friends there. While I was doing some last-minute shopping down on George Street, a strange little white-haired man stepped out of a shop doorway and offered me a pamphlet and said, Excuse me, ma'am, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? She said, I, I was disturbed by those words. When I got back to my hometown, I, I knew there was a Baptist church on the next block from me, so I sought out the pastor, and he led me to Christ. This London pastor was now very puzzled. Twice within a handful of days, he had heard practically the same testimony. He then flew to preach at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Perth, Australia, which Perth, Australia is located on the western side of the continent, the completely opposite end from where Sydney is. And when his teaching series was over, one of the deacons, a middle-aged man, took him out for a meal. This London pastor asked in conversation, mate, how'd you get saved? The man replied, well, I, I grew up in church, this church, from the age of 15, but never accepted Christ. I just hopped on the bandwagon like everybody else. Because of my business ability, I, I grew to a place of influence. I was on a business outing in Sydney just three years ago, and a curious little white-haired man stepped out of a shop doorway right in my path. I thought this to be rather obnoxious. And he offered me a religious pamphlet while asking, Excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? I thought to myself while looking at the track, What cheap junk? How dare he accost me with such a question? I tried to tell him that I was heavily involved with my church, but he wouldn't listen to me and asked me the question again. I was seething with anger all the way home from Sydney to Perth. I told my pastor of the incident, thinking he would sympathize with me. But my pastor agreed. <laughs> he had been disturbed for years, knowing that I didn't have a relationship with Jesus, and he was right. He then smiled broadly. My pastor led me to Jesus just three years ago. Now this London preacher flew back to England and was speaking at the Keswick Convention, a revival conference over there that God has used in a great way over the years. And he threw in these three testimonies. And at the close of his teaching session, his preaching hour, four elderly pastors came up to him and said, we got saved between 25 to 35 years ago, respectively, through that little man on George Street giving us a track and asking us that question. He then flew the following week to a similar convention in the Caribbean to missionaries. He shared all these testimonies at the close of his message. Three more missionaries came up to him and said, We also got saved between 15 and 25 years ago, respectively, through that little man's witness and asking us that same question on George Street in Sydney. Coming back to London, he stopped outside of Atlanta, Georgia, to speak at a naval chaplain's convention. He didn't have any peace to share these testimonies that he'd recently discovered. When his three days of preaching were over, the chaplain general took him out to eat, and over the meal, this London pastor asked, Brother, how did you become a Christian? The distinguished officer replied, Well, it's quite miraculous. You see, I was serving as a crewman on a U.S. battleship, and I lived a reprobate life. We were doing exercises in the South Pacific, and we docked at Sydney Harbor. We hit the bars with a vengeance. I got blind drunk. I wound up staggering onto the wrong bus and found myself getting dropped off on George Street. It was late at night. As I adjusted my eyes, a small, wrinkly, white-haired man stood in front of me. At first, I thought it was a ghost. He startled me and pushed a pamphlet in my hand and said, Sailor, are you saved? If you deny tonight, are you going to go to heaven? In that very moment, the fear of God hit me. I was shocked sober. I looked at him with such astonishment and ran all the way back to the battleship. I had to seek out the chaplain on board. And that night, he led me to Christ. 
I soon began to prepare for the ministry under his guidance, and here I am in charge of over a thousand chaplains, and we're bent on soul winning. This London pastor marveled at the far-reaching impact of this unknown, unnamed, faithful, personal soul winner. Six months later, he flew to speak at a convention for 5,000 missionaries in India. National pastors, actually. These were not foreign missionaries. These were, these were Indian missionaries in a remote corner in northeastern India. At the end, the, the Indian missionary in charge, a humble, gracious man, took him to his house, very small house, for a simple meal. And the London pastor asked him, so how did you as a Hindu come to Christ? He said, I, I grew up in a very privileged position. I worked for the Indian diplomatic service. I travel the world. I'm so glad for the gift for, for the forgiveness of Christ and his blood covering my sin because I'm ashamed and I'd be very embarrassed if people found out what I had gotten into. One bout of diplomatic service took me to Sydney. I was doing some last minute shopping laden with parcels of toys and clothing for my children walking down George Street. A courteous, white-haired little man stepped out of a doorway and offered me a pamphlet and said, Excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? I didn't know what to say. I thanked him, but this disturbed me. I, I got back to my town. I sought out the Hindu priest. He couldn't help me, but he gave me some advice. He said, Just to satisfy your curious mind and nothing else, go talk to the missionary in the mission house at the end of the road. Well, that day, the missionary led me to Christ. I quit Hinduism immediately and became burdened to study for the ministry. I left the diplomatic service, and here I am, by God's grace, in charge of all these missionaries, and we are winning hundreds of thousands of people to Christ. Well, eight months later, this Baptist pastor from London finally had an opportunity to preach in Sydney, Australia. He asked the local pastor he was with, have you ever heard of an elderly man who witnesses and hands out tracts on George Street? Ah, yes, I have, the pastor said. His name is Mr. Genner. Ah, but I don't think he does that anymore. He's, he's very old. I would like to meet him, this London pastor declared. And two nights later, they went to his small apartment and knocked on the door. A tiny wrinkled man slowly opened it, then warmly received them. He had him sit down in the living room and proceeded to make some tea. He was so frail that he slopped it all over the place in the saucer of each cup as he shook, trying to pour the kettle. As he sat with them, this London preacher told them all these accounts over the past couple of years or so. Mr. Genner sat with tears running down his cheeks. He said, this little old white-haired man, my story goes like this. I was serving on an Australian warship. I lived a reprobate life, but God saved me. And the change in my life was night to day in 24 hours. I was so grateful to God that I promised him that I would share Jesus in a simple witness with at least 10 people a day as God gave me strength. Sometimes I was so ill that I couldn't do it, but I made up for it at other times. I have done this for over 40 years. And in my retirement years, the best place I could find was on George Street. There were thousands of people. I got a lot of rejections. But a lot of people courteously took them. And in 40 years of doing this, I've never heard of one single person coming to Christ until today. What commitment. A spirit that continued in spite of the chaos. This man reached, if you do the numbers, 146,000 individuals personally. Somehow, someway, touching them with the gospel in his lifetime. Just one simple, faithful man who decided to be committed to do something about the plight of his generation for the sake of the gospel. The multiplication effect of how many more were reached indirectly through his witness and testimony is unfathomable, church. Mr. Genner died two weeks later. Can you imagine tonight, in your mind's eye, the reward he received when he got home to heaven? Had no, no clue that there would be one, just staying faithful. 
No one knew his name. Nobody was aware of him except for a few group of Baptists in southern Sydney. But I believe tonight beyond a shadow of a doubt that his name was famous throughout the streets of glory. Heaven knew Mr. Ginner. And can you imagine the welcome? The fanfare. How precious in his sight of the death of his saints, the Bible says. When he went home to be with the Lord in glory. Heads of eyes are closed, Father. Please. Please help us to continue, to not quit, to be committed, not be careless. But this great responsibility, yet privilege and opportunity we have to preach all these things, do the work of an evangelist. Help us, Lord. Now more than ever, you are looking for a generation that will stay faithful focused and fervent god please burn it within us heads of eyes are closed no one looking around is there one who would say brother garraway god has spoken to my heart tonight this week to surrender my life to the lord or re-surrender rededicate my life to christ that's me that's me that's me is that you would you raise your hand is that you would you raise your hand if that's you would you stand would you come forward right now right now right now would you seek the lord seek the lord in prayer would you come my wife is going to softly play that song don't pass them by would you seek the lord tonight um and i pray that you do business with god is there other others that would say brother garraway god has broken my heart burn me about reaching souls that's me that's me that's me would you raise your hand is that you tonight to be that faithful witness god bless you would you come would you come we have seats available in the front if you like to sit here would you do business with god are there young people tonight who say brother garraway god is calling me to preach or god is calling me into the ministry that is me is that you would you raise your hand is there one like that tonight is there one like that heads up and eyes are closed is there one tonight who says brother garraway if I die tonight, I don't know for sure where I would go. I'm not saved, and I need to get saved. With no one looking around, is that you? Would you raise your hand? I need to get saved. I need Jesus. I'm done resisting. I'm done. I'm giving in. That's me. Would you raise your hand? Heads about eyes are closed. Would you seek the Lord all across the room? However, God may have spoken to your heart. The altar is now open for anyone to come. Would you seek the Lord? Would you seek the Lord? Where are the young men that are going to answer this call to preach? The Christians that are going to be engaged as full-time surrendered believers. God bless you with the decisions being made tonight. God sees your faithfulness. You are essential. None of this work can be accomplished without the power of the Holy Ghost. Please take all of these messages, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, all of us cross the room. The, the, this message tonight must be in tandem with everything else that we've studied this week. As God has orchestrated these series of messages so wonderfully, I believe. is the individual that you will seek to reach tomorrow maybe you don't have anybody in mind and if not would you pray Lord bring someone across my path please
Don't pass them by. They all need the truth. You can look this way. How many do you think are in here tonight? 70? Se okay. Se let's, let's, do you mind if I round down to 70? Um, just in case there's any younger children. 70 times 7 is 490. 70 people passing out one track a day. That's 490 human beings. Different people being touched with hope. We've seen so many stories of people saved just by reading a track. Well, we just heard several, didn't we? Even through it. Times 52 equals 25,480 souls reached just within the next year. It can be done. Let's see what God can do. Thank you, Pastor. It's interesting that he would do a little math at the end of our service because I was doing math during the service. And I was doing it right when he turned around and said, is that in 2 Timothy or 1 Timothy? And my brain had to switch on for a second. No, it was good. God touched me about something during his message. He mentioned, you know, the remnant and uh, how amazing God's mercy really is to a group of people. Because uh, we do live in a wicked day. We do live in a day that is very, where being a Christian is very much out of season, right? It's not in season to be a Christian. Uh, and I was doing some, some quick math here in my mind, and then we'll be done for this revival. It's estimated, and there's really no way to know for sure, but there was approximately around 100,000 people or so in, in the Sodom and Gomorrah area. area. Could be a little below, above that, could be a little bit below that. Um, but around 100,000 or so, they believe there's about 80,000, and they have some surrounding towns and things that were all affected by that. Ten people, ten, is 0.01% of that population. If you were to put that into the population of America, and I know it fluctuates, and it just went up at least by one that we know of yesterday... About 350 million people or so, it's gone up, it's been going up steadily. But let's just, for sake of easy math, say 350 million people who are reachable, who are of sound mind. 0.01% of that is 350,000. You say, do we have 350,000 you know, righteous people? I don't know, I, I would hope so. God's look at our nation right now tells me maybe not so much. So we can get discouraged and say, we can't reach 350,000 people. We barely have 350,000 people around us right now. There's 350,000 people in St. Louis. We're going to reach them all, Pastor? Let's be realistic. Okay, I'll be realistic with you. But God communed with Abraham that night. And Abraham wanted to be responsible for 0.01%. So let's partner with all the other churches in America. And let's say, what if we were just to reach 0.01% of the remnant that was needed? That's 350 people. In just a couple of months, by God's grace and your grace, I'll reach three years here as your pastor. You say... I, well, I believe that a lot more is going to get done if we set goals than if we don't set goals. And uh, I, I, do take, I do take a little bit of a defensive position against people who say, well, it's not about numbers. You need to read more of the Bible. Because God numbers just about everything. If he numbers the hair on our, hairs on our head, he numbered every person that went out to battle. He numbered how many people that fought. He numbered how many people died. He numbered how many kings, how many generations, how many tribes, how many descendants, how many sons, how many daughters they had, how many people. He, he numbered everything. Maybe we ought to set in our mind that a good goal for our church is to be consistently reaching and growing 350 people. And that'd be a good start. I think God could do more than that here in our church. You say, well, what does that mean, Pastor? Well, that really means that about our, everyone here in our membership, or let's just say the active attenders, we just need to be responsible for four more people. Do you think you could do the work of an evangelist to four people and preach to them Christ 
and get them growing in Christ and get them. You think you get four people? You saw in, in really two weeks of concentrated soul winning uh, a year and a half or so ago when we had 262 people, we broke all of our attendance records. Can you imagine a concerted effort of a year's worth of that? I, don't, I really don't. I mean, we've seen some explosive growth even in, in modern day church and a few of our churches around the country right now because they've just been very, very serious about this thing of reaching their area with the gospel. Let's see. A number goal, Pastor? Yeah, I know, I know, a number goal. It's interesting, this coming Sunday, we're starting two new sermon series in our church on Sunday morning. We'll start a new series on asking for trouble, the things you do in your life that invite trouble. On Sunday night, we're starting our series on how to win a soul to Christ. Amen. I've talked about that for many months, and we have good soul winners here, but there's a, there's a way to do it right and do it well and be effective, more effective at it. And we're going to begin that training time on Sunday nights. A little bit different than typical Sunday night type of things I like to preach, but I believe that God wants us to be very skilled and very confident in what we're doing when we're telling people about Christ. And maybe that'll go along well with what we just heard. Saturday's coming, 10 o'clock. Let's stand together. Four people. Four people. Man, doesn't the Lord ask so much of us? He just, he's just so domineering over us to help us reach our remnant. Four people. I've got some other thoughts on that in my mind. Thank you so much for this week. I hope you'll greet his whole family. Thank them for being with us. Thank him for the preaching, their music, and I hope you'll take advantage of the materials they have in the back. And I hope to see you Saturday morning, 10 o'clock, as we go out and knock on some doors. And I, I just I haven't ran into a whole bunch of other people doing it before. I know there are other good churches in our area. I don't mean to speak bad of them, but as far as our area is concerned, no one else is knocking on their doors reaching them. Somebody's got to do it. Thank you for being here all the day. Everyone who's been here every single night, I appreciate that very, very much. If you made a, a decision tonight, if God spoke to your heart, I'd like to know about it. I'm sure Brother Gary would like to know about it as well, as God has used him to to um, to speak to your heart through the Lord, and um, that'll encourage him as well. As he, uh, I know how it is. You go preach to a different group of people and strangers, and you're like, what What did they get? What did they get? That'll encourage him. That'll give maybe keep them uh, more alert as they drive them tonight. Yes. They're gonna They're gonna head home tonight. So if you, need, if you need something, please go back there quickly. Be, be brief about it. They're going to drive home. So let's pray for their safety. And would you pray for their safety as they travel home tonight as a family? Lord, thank you for meeting with us the last few days. Thank you for all that we've heard. And I pray, God, that we would make real changes in our life. God, I pray that we would develop a better relationship with the Holy Spirit and that we would trust him to be our guide and our helper. And Lord, the source of strength and power in our life as a Christian, I pray that our church would become consumed with being filled with the Holy Spirit. And Lord, when it comes to serving and working and loving people and reaching people, Lord, even despite difficult circumstances, I pray that our church would endure and continue as you've called upon us to do. Lord, I pray that you'd give the Garraway family and all those who are traveling home tonight, give us safety, please. And I pray that uh, we'd see lasting fruit in our church from this revival time. Bring us back again safe, Lord, Saturday for soul winning time. And then again, may we have a wonderful Sunday together. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you so much. Have a great night.